This episode brought to you by Tomes, which is a natural sleep and sound healing portal helping people globally to get to sleep faster and stay asleep longer through Tomes.com. That's www.tauhomms.com. Hey, hey, I'm Lord Toby Wright, and this is My Right Stuff News. Hello, and welcome to My Right Stuff Good News Network. I'm Sir Gareth Dighton. I'm filling in for Lord Toby Wright, who is away. After taking the red pill, Toby believes that Morpheus can answer his question. What is the Matrix? Oh, wait a minute. That's somebody else. Oh, no. I've done it again. I've confused Toby with Neo from The Matrix. I really need to stop doing that. No, seriously, Toby is away making another awesome record with one of our previous guests and friends of the show, Frame42. So I've been asked to stand in, which I am more than happy to do for you lovely people, while Toby goes and does what he does best, apart from hosting this podcast, of course. So, let's kick things off with the music news. BTS released Proof, a three-disc anthology album from the South Korean boy band, which features three new tracks, as well as a whole heap of demo tracks. After an apparently tumultuous relationship behind the scenes, Halsey has released her new song, So Good. The single was produced by Max Martin and Tobias Carlson. The story of So Good began on May the 22nd, when Halsey posted on TikTok. She said, basically, I have a song that I love and I want to release as soon as possible, but the record label won't let me. Jack White has released his new single, If I Die If I Die Tomorrow. He states If I Die Tomorrow is for the most part a solemn country ballad, though in classic white fashion, it's cut through with some strange and surreal guitar work. If I Die Tomorrow will let me know if I left in peace. English alternative legends populate itself have returned with some new music seven years after their last release, even though they've been very active on the live music circuit. Their brand new track, Poppy Strike Back, was released last Friday, June the 10th, and I caught this track live when I saw them last December, and very, very good it is too, classic poppies at their best. You can buy it directly from the band at www.shopreleatedself.com or listen via the usual streaming sites. They've also announced the Lucky Sevens tour for autumn across the UK. They're playing seven Seven shows they call in a Bristol, Bournemouth, Oxford, London, Sheffield, Birmingham, and London. Tickets are on sale now and get them while you can. And I will see you in Bristol. Come and say hi if you were there. Also, if you are a fan and, and you want to know more about Populate itself, stay tuned for a future episode as we currently have some irons in the fire, so to speak, with Graham from the band on what we predict will be another great episode. Now, over to film and TV. For All Mankind Season 3 premieres on Apple+. Plus. The, season, the series takes place in an alternate timeline with the Soviets have put the first man on the moon, triggering a never-ending space race and a cascade of other changes from the history that we know and love. The first two seasons dealt with US versus USSR tensions and then outright fighting on the lunar surface. The new season jumps ahead to the early 90s and a new frontier as three separate groups compete to see who will be the first to reach Mars. Impractical Jokers are always sh- shaking things up, and they're back for season 9, following the exit of longtime friend and cast member Joe Gatto. In each episode, a new celebrity helps the Jokers out in their latest challenges. Joining the guys on this season are fellow Staten Islanders Method Man and Colin Jost, along with AEW's Chris Jericho, Brooke Shields, comedians Gillian Bell, Adam Pally, John Gabrus and David Cross, along with Rob Riggle and some others. From Disney and Pixie comes an animated sci-fi adventure, the definitive origin story of Buzz Lightyear, who's voiced by Chris Evans. The hero inspired the toy Lightyear, follows the legendary space ranger on an intergalactic adventure alongside his ambitious recruits, Izzy, Moe and Darby, and his robot companion, Socks. As this motley crew embark on their toughest mission yet, they must learn to work as a team to escape the evil Dr. Zerg and his dutiful robot army who are never far behind. 
Jurassic World Dominion hits theatres. Four years after the destruction of Isla Nebula, dinosaurs now live and hunt alongside humans all over the world. This fragile balance will reshape the future and determine once and for all whether human beings are to remain the apex predators on a planet that they now live with history's most fearsome predators. Also hit in theatres is the highly acclaimed British comedy Brian and Charles. The film follows Brian, Brian, uh, not our Brian, a different Brian, a lonely inventor in rural Wales who spends his days building quirky and conventional contraptions that seldom work. Undeterred by his lack of success, Brian attempts his biggest project yet. Uh, three days, a washing machine and various spare parts later, he's invented Charles, an artificially intelligent robot who learns English from a dictionary and has an obsession with cabbages. What follows is a humorous and entirely heartwarming story about friendship, family, finding love and letting go. Well, I'm really looking forward to catching that one. Spiderhead gets its theatrical release in a state-of-the-art penitentiary run by brilliant visionary Steve Abnesty, who is played by Chris Helmsworth. Inmates wear a surgically attached device that administers dosage of mind-altering drugs in exchange for commuted sentences. There are no bars, no cells, or orange jumpsuits. In Spiderhead, incarcerated volunteers are free to be themselves until they're not. At times, they're a better version. Uh, need to lighten up? There's a drug for that. At a loss for words? There's a drug for that too. But when the two subjects, Jeff uh, and Lizzie, who are played by Miles Teller and Journey Smollett, form a connection, their path to redemption takes a uh, twistier turn as Abnasty's experiments start to push the limits of free will altogether. Now over to the world of sports. In Formula 1 news this past weekend was the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Max Verstappen won, with Red Bull teammates Sergio Perez in second and George Russell third. Both Ferraris suffered with engine issues and did not finish. And so this shakes up the standings now, with Verstappen leading, followed by Perez and Charles Leclerc, drop, dropping a third. This weekend is the Canadian Grand Prix, so let's see if Ferrari can fix their engine issues, or if Red Bull can continue to pull away from the rest of the pack. The UEFA Nations League, as well as the CONCACAF Nations League, are currently happening, with so many games on at the moment. Check to see when your favourite teams are playing and how to watch it. There are also quite a few international friendly matches on in the run-up to the World Cup. Speaking of the World Cup, Wales football team have also recently qualified for the upcoming World Cup in Qatar in November. This year, they qualified after a thrilling game against the Ukraine in Cardiff last week and will enter Group B alongside USA, Iran and England. The best of luck to them, obviously, I am a tad biased being a Welshman myself. This is the first World Cup Wales have qualified for since 1958, when a young Pele sealed their fate and scored the goal that knocked Wales out of the World Cup and broke our hearts. In gear and tech news. For audio professionals, the names Neve needs no introduction. Installed in world-class control rooms worldwide, their large format consoles have recorded countless iconic hits since the 1970s. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could infuse your DAW-based studio productions with the authoritative sound of a Neve front end? Well, now you can. The Neve 88M two-channel USB bus-powered audio interface incorporates the same transformer balance circuitry as the company's flagship 88RS console. Equipped with reference-grade AD stroke DA conversion, the 88M delivers the uncompromising audio quality and peerless musicality only Neve can provide. Designed and built in England, the Neve 88M brings home the sound of Abbey Road, Air and Capital Studio. The 88M2 retails for $1,245 and you can find Neve here. And that's all the news that's making the news this week, June 17th, 2022. Take care, y'all. And now over to you, Toby. Oh, hey. <laughs> Welcome back to My Right Stuff, which is a film, TV, sports, music, adventure, and inspirational lifestyle podcast. I'm your host, Lord Toby Rage Wright. And today we are joined by rock and roll royalty. He really is. He's played on some of rock's most influential albums, with artists such as Ozzy Osbourne, Billy Idol, Vince Neil, and many, many more. But before we meet our guest, I want to thank you, all of our supporters who stream, download, watch, and support My Ride Stuff. Keep spreading the word, my friends. We really do appreciate it, and it really is helping. Thank you. Be sure to click on our show notes below to follow our link tree for a full list of all the channels we stream on, as well as all of our sites and social media platforms. If you'd like to donate to My Right Stuff, please follow our support link 
Every single dollar helps support the My Right Stuff crew who make all of this possible. And of course, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, as well as the podcast channel of your choice, so you never miss a single episode. And after this episode, please head on over to MyRightStuff.com, click on the Store tab, and pick up some snazzy merch for those bodies, which would make an ideal present for your nearest and dearest, so get them now. Well, before we get started on today's episode, I'd like to introduce my co-host, the man who always does his drinking at night and takes his shots in the dark. Ooh. Oh, what a bad pun. My distinguished co-host, Sir Gareth Dighton. Hey, Gareth, how are you today? Hey, Toby, my man. I was things with you. Things are looking good here, and I'm very much looking forward to chatting to today's guest. Very, very excited, like I am for all of our guests on the show, because we have such a wide range of people who come and speak to us, uh, and every day feels like a school day, my friend. That's awesome. And, can, you know, because I understand you've been checking out some new music this week. And I certainly have What do you got been. for us today? Well, this week, I ha- well, this time, I should say, I'm going to talk to you about Orbital, who are one of my favorite electronic artists from over the years. And they've been working on some very interesting tracks over the last year. They've announced a new compilation album called 30-something. They missed their 30th anniversary because the world was closed, uh, and they wanted to celebrate the past whilst also celebrating the future. So they've compiled a unique best of, uh, and the collection contains reworks, remakes, and remixes, which gives us something new yet something familiar actually it includes a track they worked on with the late great professor Stephen Hawking Where Are We Going which was used in the 2012 Olympic opening ceremony in London amongst 22 other new but old tracks if that makes any sense to you Um, and what else I want to talk to you about is the forthcoming release from another one of my favourite bands uh, called and you will know us by the Trail of Dead they are back with their 11th studio album called X1 Bleed Now and that's due for release on July the 15th Uh, Conrad Keeley and co have been keeping details pretty quiet so far uh, but you know it's going to be an incredible album I would describe their sound for those who don't know them as a mix between the Who and Sonic Youth they're musically as competent as the who with a discordance controlled noise and genius of sonic youth that sounds pretty tasty doesn't it and you'd be right to be excited about it because toby my friend i certainly am they're also doing some dates in the states to promote this at the moment and i'm kind of hoping they make this way over uh, to come and spread the love in the uk um one of the most loudest bands i've ever seen live only three bands i've seen have left me with tinnitus after a show one of them being and you will notice by the trail of dead that the others being left field and motor head so they're in pretty good company from from kind of that perspective also for you lovely people out there if you think that your band or you know a friend's band is good enough to be featured in this part of the show then please feel free to comment in the comment section beneath the uh, video on youtube or actually get in touch with me directly and i will check you out and if i think you are worthy of a mention then we sure will that's excellent gareth thank you and those were two definitely worth checking out Thank you for your picks, and they're always stellar. Thank you very much, my friend. Well, right now, I'd like to introduce our guest. For those into hard rock music, he needs no introduction. And there's a chance he's played on some of your favorite albums. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a nice warm welcome for Phil Susan. Hey, Phil, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Toby. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, excellent, my friend, and you're certainly welcome. It's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, before we get going, I'd like to introduce my co-host, uh, Sir Gareth Dighton. Gareth, how are you? Uh, very well indeed, Phil. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and have a chat with us today. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to speak to someone who's played on so many of my favorite albums. So actually, thank you very much for, for wow. to kind of coming to join us. Well, thank you. That's a, a lovely introduction. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Well, Toby, let's take a shot in the dark and learn a bit more about today's excellent guest. Ha ha. All right. Uh, well, he's uh, but sort of. <laughs> but it's, indeed, yes. Actually, actually, sort of apologies about the pun. Um, <laughs> Well, here at well here at kind of at my right stuff, we like to start near kind of the beginning. Um, did you grow up in a musical household? Oh, um, I suppose so. I mean, maybe as much as anyone else did. Uh, uh, you know, my mom was a, a very big uh, uh, radio fan. She would have the radio turned on all, all day long. And, you know, I would hear Beatles and I would hear current, um, 
popular music coming through the radio 24 seven. Um, and, uh, so in that respect, I was always exposed to music. Um, there were people in my family who were musicians. Uh, so we had relatives who, uh, who lived in France, who lived in Paris, who were, who were musicians. And, uh, I was very fond of them. They were my mom's cousins and, um, I was real fond of them and they were very musical. And so anytime they came over, uh, they would, uh, oh, they would bring records or they would bring me a little wooden guitar. And, uh, so I sort of was exposed to music in that, in that way. Wow. So what was the first musical instrument you played? Oh, ah, <sighs> you know, it, it probably was the first things that you would pick up at, um, at, at, at school. I mean, you're talking about actually learning something. So yeah. it would have been, it would have been recorders and it would have been melodicas. And, and I actually ran with that ball as well. I learned the recorder and I learned the piccolo recorder and the alto recorder. And the, you know, I wanted to learn as much as I could about these things. Um, but prior to that, you know, having a little, you know, aforementioned wooden guitar around the house, of course, I pick it up and I play it and, and, uh, and mess around trying to make sounds out of these things. And, and, and sitting in front of a, a very, uh, a very cool gift that I got when I was probably only two years old or three years old, which was a, a real miniature record player. And so oh, you could wow. open this thing up and you could put all these records on. And at the time they were, um, they were a lot of kind of tie dyed vinyl American, uh, kids songs and stuff like that. Uh, that, uh, that you'd imagine a kid would be listening to. Um, right. so that was a, that was a favorite thing. I would sit in front of the record player apparently and put these records on and sing along and then take a record off put another record on and sing along. It's like solo karaoke, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> that's That was kind of my introduction, I suppose, to music and music was always around. Later on, I, I learned, uh, uh, when I was, uh, about uh, 10, I started playing the violin for real. And then I okay. took uh, music lessons uh, all the way to grade eight and uh, played that until nice. uh, I was in my early 20s. Oh, wow. Awesome. Nice. Which was about three weeks ago. I believe. <laughs> about three weeks ago. <laughs> totally. What are you laughing at? Because <laughs> <laughs> my birthday was about three weeks ago, too, and I just turned 19. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. I can relate. Yeah. You just turned 90 what? <laughs> Me too. As well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I believe that when you were playing the violin, you had a special concert performance for a closed door guest. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I went to a school that was a, a grammar school um, called William Ellis in Highgate. And um, the thing about William Ellis that was great is it had some really, really smart people there. And so various um, things um, that were uh, 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 that would come out of there were were groups of people that would uh, find common interest in stuff like um, you know early early world computing electronics uh, all kinds of stuff like that. But it also had a, a, an amazing music department, and it was one of the best music departments in any of the schools around. Um, there was also, uh, I, th I think William Ellis was the guy who was credited with inventing rugby. I think yeah, anyway, William rugby Ellis. was the, yeah. yeah uh, so, 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 uh, rugby was the game of, uh, of the school. Um, and it was very convenient that, uh, music, uh, lessons would take place the same day and the same time as rugby, which meant you could either do one or the other. And fortunately for my health joints, bones, and everything else, uh, I, I opted to do music. I really could, you know, it wasn't that interested in rugby. You know, every time they came back on a Wednesday afternoon, this, you know, broken clavicle, broken this, broken that, broken shoulders, broken everything. All right. Uh, the most I would get was a broken string, you know? And uh, so that was very convenient. <laughs> But we had this music department and it was, it was terrific. And, um, some amazing musicians went to our school, um, and we had a great orchestra, uh, and that orchestra was a, you know, school miniature symphony orchestra, but I've been to recitals here in the United States, 
one, one in San Diego recently of a of a bona fide orchestra, and it was it was dreadful. It was awful. And I was thinking to myself, how on earth does anyone get away with playing so badly? It was like the Portsmouth Sinfonia, if you know what I mean. And right. uh, we, as a school, I mean, a, a bunch of teenagers sounded so much better than that. But, uh, you know, a, a bad orchestra, there's nothing worse than a bad orchestra. Well, only one person has to play out a tune, and it's just cacophony. <laughs> so we were a really good o orchestra. I mean, seriously. Um, and one of the things that we would do every year was to do a, a recital for the Queen of England. So she would come, she would roll up wow. in a big Rolls Royce Phantom or whatever it is that she gets carted around in and uh, get out. We, had a, we also had a great uh, CCF uh, combined cadet force. And um, so there was a lot of pomp and circumstance. There was all these cadets lined up and they would you know, bring her in and she would sit in the front and we would do this recital. And uh, it's quite special. So these were some exactly. of the things that I remembered about my school. I loved my school. I mean, I talked to some of my friends that, today, and it's amazing. There's a, a small percentage that say, wow, oh, you know, it sucked. It was horrible. I hate it. And, and that wasn't my experience <laughs> at all. I loved it. I mean, it was, I'm, I'm, I'm by nature, I'm, I'm a very inquisitive and intellectual kind of person. I want to learn as much as I can about everything. And so for me, this was like, I was like a sponge. It was like, wow, there was electronics and there was like video production and there was mathematics and there was physics and chemistry and biology. I mean, my hobby as a kid was, a chem was chemistry. Can you imagine okay. buying somebody a chemistry set today? They were, you, you couldn't do that anymore. You couldn't buy this kind of stuff. I mean, they, no. won't, say, they won't sell a kid matches today. So it was, um, you know, this, these were all things <laughs> yeah, that, that I was just like, wow, this is great, you know? And in the middle of this, we had music. Gotcha. Good times. Heck yeah. Well, you said you were like 10 or 11. You first came across guitars and an electric guitar and became intrigued with rock and roll. Who were some of the artists that inspired you? Um, and, when what, I, and what was it that hooked you? Hmm. So um, when, when I was back when I was a kid, <laughs> you might relate to this. I don't know. But the coolest thing you could have um, were, were these little... I guess they were Japanese little transistor radios, and they were about so big. Okay. And right. uh, you could have like a single earpiece in them, but they had a speaker in the front as well. And um, they came in different bright colors, like day glow green and day glow orange and, and all of these cool colors. And every kid had one. Um, and that was the iPod. I mean, that was what you listened to. And uh, the only difference was you'd sit there and listen and listen and listen and wait for a particular song to come on. Um, right. So. Um, there were these, uh, um, there was this magazine that I, uh, subscribed to. I canceled my Beano and my core magazine and I subscribed to something called words. I don't know okay. if anyone would remember this, but it was a magazine that came out. I think it came out about once a month. Might've been once a week. No, once a month maybe. And it was the top 30 songs on the charts with all the lyrics in them. And so, then some articles about some of the artists and stuff. It was very, very cool. But because you had this top 30, I mean, there was radio that would play top 30. So it was inevitable. You'd have to wait, wait, wait for whatever songs you liked in the top 30 to come on. And then you right. could hear them. And that was uh, the way, you know, we got music. Um, uh, within that, the kind of music that was starting to really intrigue me, of course, I love the Beatles, um, was kind of early, very early 70s, um, late 60s, early 70s rock. So the stuff that was playing on the radio was free, was of course the beginnings of glam rock. Um, great songwriters, um, uh, tons of great songwriters. You weren't really hearing Zeppelin too much, but people started, I started hearing that at people's houses. I had friends okay. who, who had el older siblings and the older siblings right. were listening to Led Zeppelin one when it came out and that that kind of stuff early deep purple early all of that stuff but free was a huge huge influence i love that band still do excellent yeah nice. i believe you started working professionally in bands from around 1980 onwards can you tell us about these early years sure um you know we started uh uh I had been playing guitar and then I, started, I switched to bass. 
I wasn't switched to bass. I just started playing bass as well. And then um, I was actually <laughs> I was actually a pre med, so I was going to be a doctor. And um, this was my passion was was chemistry, physics, biology, as I mentioned before. Um, so I um, I had done all my O levels, and I I did like 10, 10 O levels or something crazy. And then I had to do physics, chemistry, and biology. I thought oh, I'm going to be a doctor. I should do A levels in those. And then when I started applying to medical schools, they went, no, 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 we don't want you to do biology because we're going to teach you all that. We want you to do math. And I said, well, I already did my A-levels. He said, well, so I took a seven months off and went to a crammer and then I did pure and applied mathematics as A-level and then I did economics while I was at it. Wow. So now I have five A-levels and I was ready to go into, uh, wow. into, uh, into medical school. And um, I think it was my dad sent me to a client of his. Um, he was a, he would sell uh, insurance, insurance, not insurance, life assurance, um, any kind of financing, stuff like that. That's what he sort of got, was, into, was doing. And one of his clients had started a company called Career Analysts. And my dad said, you should go to the Career Analysts. They'll tell you what you should be doing. And I said, I know what I want to do. It's what I need to go there for. Oh, no, no, they'll tell you. So I said, okay, I'll go. And they sat me down in rooms for about two days and we did IQ tests and stuff. And I tested pretty high on my IQ and all of these other things. And um, then they called me in and they said, hey, so you want to be a doctor? And I said, yeah. And they said, why? And I said, I, I had no idea. I mean, my mom was kind of a, a nurse, a general nurse. Uh, and that had been really it. I was interested in it. And they said, no, you should be a computer programmer. You have incredible like logic. Uh, you've performed really well in these. And I had no interest in being a computer programmer. And I said, okay. So all of a sudden I went home and started thinking about what do I really love doing? And what I love doing was playing music. So I made deals with myself. If, if I had to, homework to do, I would do my homework. And if I do my homework, then I can pick up my guitar and I can work on, I can play guitar all night. Homework was done in about 30 minutes, guitar, three hours. So, Sweet. you know, that was, the, that was really the thing that sort of made me think, you know, maybe I can't do both of these anymore. Maybe I should do one of them and, and, and do the one I'm most passionate about. Um, and immediately I set out, you know, after I told said parents that I wasn't going to be a doctor and dealt with the fallout from that, um, then I sort of started trying to find bands. I started going to every single audition I could find and uh, trying to play with as many people as I could. We had bands at school. Some of those bands had already kind of formed themselves by this time. Mark Bedford went to my school. They formed Madness. Madness went off to do things. That, there was a band called Sore Throat that was a big band around the London scene at the time. They had gone off. I mean, there was just all of these bands, and then they sort of went off and, uh, and started. I kind of missed the boat on that one, I guess. So I was right. really trying to get to as many auditions as I could because I, was, I, was I wasn't going to find a band at school. My school bands... We're never going to work because the people in the bands had gone into other things. They were not interested in starting a band. So one of them became right. a, uh, a financial guy. Another guy became an actor. Another guy became a, uh, a NASA scientist. Another guy, professor of mathematics. And these were all guys who played music. And so they went off and found the things they wanted to do. That's pretty cool. So how did you end up in a band with That's Ozzy cool. Osbourne and... And how long did it? How long did you work with him? Uh, well, it you know it's very much one thing leads to another in this business. It's it's um, right stepping stones. So okay. you know when you when you you know I, I never really thought of the concept of making it because that was never really a priority of mine. My priority was just to work, um, do what I love doing. And hopefully be able to pay my bills. I think that was the, those were the realistic goals I set for myself. Right. So cool. I started out playing with small bands and the small bands came to bigger bands. And gradually, London's a very small music scene. Everybody knew everybody. And, you know, right. someone's name starts to get around. Uh, I auditioned one time for a band with Simon Kirk from Bad Company, who I was actually okay. thrilled, thrilled about because he was also the drummer in Free. Um, right got the gig playing with them, played with them for a while. Um, when that band didn't really uh, progress or, or work out, 
through uh, our, our label had been Swansong and we would be managed by Peter Grant because oh, of wow. Simon. And so then I get a call from Jimmy Page, of all people. And next thing I know, I'm playing with Jimmy Page. Um, and we're wow. trying to, you know, we're in a room putting a new band together that would have, that was to become the firm. And I played with Jimmy for, oh, it must have been about six or seven months, maybe even a little bit more. Uh, and we just, just played for, for fun, for old times' sake, for good times' sake, just getting back into the swing of things. Yeah. And during this time, I had been... Um, not pre uh, not pushed to, but it had been suggested that I go take an audition for Ozzy, and I got the audition. Um, so now I had a dilemma, which was, do I stay with Jimmy or do I go play with Ozzy? Right. And I remember having a chat with Jimmy about it, and he basically said, look, I don't think the band's really going to be ready to do anything for another year and a half or two, um, so it really depends on whether you want to do something right now. I'd love to have you if you want to stick around, but and I, I elected to go and go play with Ozzy. So um, that's how I found myself doing that. And I worked with Ozzy for wow. um, three and a half years, maybe. We did a lot, oh, a lot of touring. Yeah, I bet. Um, they actually must have been some crazy, some crazy times. Um, and I bet you've got some stories to tell. Are you able to share any with us without sort of incriminating yourself too much? Well, I mean, it's it. I, I think. Um, I mean, I don't have anything as 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 uh, as uh, um, as like startling as the exposing Jimmy Savile or anything like that. But <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's not that, but it was. Um, I, I think just generally, I mean, the whole time was a very special time, um, and that's mm -hmm. that's what I choose to really remember. There were lots and lots of very funny things that happened. Ozzy is a hysterically funny guy. I mean, he's a practical joker. He's yeah. he's very much a big uh, a, a big kid at heart, and um, so everything has kind of a funny side to it. Um, yeah. But the, it was a it was a it was a special time, I think, because you know we had a, a a music world that had just really opened up. All of a sudden, there was not just the little transistor radio. There were stereos, there were big concerts, there were videos on TV. Access was becoming um, not just uh, what, uh, huge, it was also ubiquitous. I mean, it was everywhere you looked, there was music. So to come into this, this world right at that time, um, I think was, it, it couldn't have been bigger for me. All of a sudden, it, I felt like I was being dragged by the scruff of the neck through an incredible experience. And sure, we toured and toured and toured. That Ultimate Sin tour went on for 15 months. And during that time, uh, we were home very little. Um, we were not accessible. No cell phones. It was very peaceful. Um, right. And you, you had to learn to sort of get along with the people on your bus. Um, and they were going to be your friends for the next, uh, and friends and family for the next few months. Um, and so we kept ourselves amused. And the way we'd keep ourselves amused was with jokes. Practical jokes, telling jokes, mm. clowning around, doing silly things, and we did. We did lots of stupid and silly things. Um, uh, you know, these days I think people have to be more careful about what they do. You can't say the wrong thing and you can't have a you know with, without getting into trouble. But we didn't mince our words. We we laughed at ourselves. We laughed at everybody else and we laughed at ourselves, and we didn't take ourselves too seriously. And we had great humor, and that was. That was the best thing about it. You know, I look at bands now and you see people sitting there staring seriously going, I really want to tell this joke, but I might be labeled bad or, or you know, sexist or racist or whatever it is. And it's like, ah, was it John Cleese that said he couldn't really work as a comedian anymore now? <laughs> it's, it's, right, right. Comedy has kind yeah. of died. It's, it's died. Yeah, terrible. I mean, you, I mean, the Pink Panther. I love the Pink Panther. You can't have a Pink Panther anymore, right? Right, exactly. Or, or any of the or Life of Brian. It's sacrilegious. I mean, Life of Brian has become a parody of itself. You know, it's, it's exactly. <laughs> it's, so that's uh, that's too bad. But for, for us, it was no no limits. Anything to to have a laugh. Anything to have a, a a good time. You know, any jokes that we did. I mean, our jokes were were were. You know, I remember coming home one day from a, a show in uh, 
I think it was Salt Lake City. And after the show, I'd come home, got changed, gone to a rock club, spent all night out at a rock club, and come back at about three o'clock in the morning to find Ozzy um, in the corridor of the hotel, uh, basically <laughs> been arrested. And um, uh -oh. yeah, we used to we used to rent a whole floor. We didn't rent sure. one room because we wanted some privacy as well and security. So we put everybody on the same floor of the hotel. And I came, I was trying to figure out what's going on. And so transpired, he thought I was in the room. So he had removed every single piece of furniture on the floor and stacked it in front of my door to stop me from getting out <laughs> in full view of the security cameras. So they sort of let him really kind of pile this up before they decided to stop him. And, you know, the, the cherry on the on the ice, uh, the, the, the cherry on the top was, was me walking in going, what, was, what are you doing sitting outside my room? Well, I thought you were inside the room. No, no, I'm not inside the room. I've been out all night. Oh, so, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Silly thing. That's awesome. <laughs> that's that's very, very, very good. Very yeah. good indeed. Love it. Well, can you tell us about some of the other bands and projects you've been involved with, like Billy Idol and yeah. Kings of the Sun, Steve Kings Lucifer, of the Sun. you know. Wow, Kings of the Sun. Well, I, love I, that. I, well, I got some dirt, baby. <laughs> yeah, I love that band. The Hode Brothers, Cliff and Chris Hode. Um, right. So, uh, you know, after I worked with Ozzy for quite some time, uh, uh, it got to a point where... Um, I had I'd written a, a very big song for Ozzy, a song called "Shot in the Dark," as you'd alluded to right. earlier, Gareth. And um, I was did, now did, having did. to write a whole record. So I was working on writing a record. I wrote a bunch of songs, very much modelled after Ozzy type of songs. They had the the vibe, the feel. Um, yeah, yeah. And it came time to me being you know having to to cut a deal uh, for the next leg of of uh, of, of the, the next album. And to be honest, I just couldn't cut the deal I wanted to cut. Um, it was very, uh, it always meant, been made, made very clear to all of us um, by Sharon, who manages Ozzy, that, you know, we were there to make Ozzy look and sound as best as he possibly could. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for, for whatever our deal was. And if we were not happy with that, we were free to move on and there'd probably be a whole line of people outside who'd be happy to take that to, to step in. Sure. Uh, and it got to that point where I just I went back and forth for quite some time and really was not able to make that deal that I felt I was comfortable with. In the meantime, I, Billy Idol, who I'd started becoming quite friendly with, had asked me to put a band together with him. So okay. um, the, the, the reasons, no one could understand really why I went to play with Billy um, after Ozzy. They seemed to be two very different types of music. And um, yeah. The reason I think goes back to London again, and you know, growing up, I, we grew up in a. I, I grew up in a flat in Maida Vale, and uh, for people who don't know, Maida Vale's part of London. It's in West London, but it's really where punk was born. So the Clash, the London SS, Kilburn and the High Roads, Generation X, they all came from, from, from uh, Maida Vale, Paddington, and so that happened in the mid seventies. So mid seventies, I was about fourteen, fifteen. That was kind of a new. That was the energy music for my generation. It was like, wow. I sort of didn't like punk because I thought, eh, I'm kind of more into classic rock, and I also developed a, a bigger uh, uh, um, passion for fifties Americana rock and roll. So these two musics were sort of not really punk. Uh, but yeah. there was no denying the energy that was going on, and it was not just the energy of the music; it was the energy of a generation, and it was it was it was everything we did. I went to the London Polytechnic to see the Sex Pistols. I sat on the side of the stage. You know, it was great. Um, Sid Vicious took my beer, which I wasn't supposed to have because I was underage anyway. But it was that cool. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, but uh, it uh, it was so. Uh, Later on in years, I had tried to get into punk bands. I had a friend who played drums in Generation X, and he was trying to get me into punk bands. And I, I was just four years too late to that party. I was just too young. So naturally, cut to 1988 or whenever it was, all of a sudden, Billy's asking me to put a band together. And that was like, yeah, I've been wanting to do this since 1970-something. <laughs> since that was music to my ears. 
So I said, yeah, of course I'd love to do this. Mm -hmm. And so I went and worked with Billy. We did Charmed Life together. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a difficult album to do. It was grueling. We, were, I mean, we did it in LA. It started off great. And all of a sudden, there was just so many people hanging around that had nothing to do with the band. And eventually, I think the focus got lost. And I was not enjoying my time there with Billy. So I left the album. Uh, I left it at the end of the album and moved on. Uh, Got it. So I went to play with a band called Beggars and Thieves and moved to New York. We did an album in Atlantic. Uh, that was, that was uh, uh, pretty cool. And then from there, my dear friend Vince Neal had left Motley Crue. And I got a phone right. call from him and from his manager and uh, uh, friend, other friends, uh, Jack Blades from Night Ranger. And they said, hey, you need to come down here and put a band together for your friend Vince. So I put a band together with Vince. We did the, uh, the Exposed album, which, funnily enough, I brought back all those Aussie songs for the Exposed album. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. If you ever listen to the Exposed <laughs> album, it's song. interesting. I mean, <laughs> Look in Her Eyes is, is, uh, is, um, is, uh, uh, is Bark at the Moon and uh, The Edge is S-A-T-O. And there's, I mean, there's a parallel for each of those songs. Wow, you, okay. can, you can hear the Aussie kind of, the intention, the Aussie intention. I did right. that album, and, and uh, once the album was finished, uh, again, it was another situation where a band was just was not, was starting to fall apart. Um, there had been some issues, some changes, and, uh, and um, in the band, and it just started falling apart. And so I just... Right. I said, you know, maybe it's time to little, take a little time off. I took some time off, took about nine months off. And uh, then after that, I went to play with Johnny Halliday. So, nice. And that was um, probably 1990. Oh, we had an earthquake, didn't we? 1990. When was the earthquake? Yeah, 94. 94. In January of 94. Right. So 94, we had the earthquake. And by about 94. Five or 90, 95, I started playing with Johnny. No, I played okay. with him in 94. It was right off the earthquake. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got a call from, my, from Chris Kimsey, who was a producer, who also produced right. Bad Company. I met him when I was working with Simon. And Chris, Chris had suggested I come down and I play on some tracks in LA. Played on the tracks, got on great with Johnny. He asked me to join his band. And I did four albums, or five albums, or four tours with him. Nice. So, so uh, yeah, so then I, I, I moved back to France and I worked with Johnny for all those years, like five years right. or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I finished that, I started working with Luca. Though. We wrote a lot together. Uh, he's, he's a great writing partner and we did a lot of great stuff. And we toured a lot, we traveled a lot, uh, wrote stuff for not only for his own band, we wrote a song for Toto that, right. was, that was nominated for a Grammy, which is cool. Congratulations. Um, yeah, we didn't win it, but that's all right. It's all good. Nomination special too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, absolutely. yeah and, absolutely. And then after that, uh, what happened after that? Then it was John Waite for three years. Okay. And then it was, uh, who I love dearly. John's such a great singer and such a great artist. Oh, I know. I know. Great writer. Um. And then I, my dear friend Richie Carson, I put put his band together. We did his first three tours together. Sweet. And in the middle of that, I started doing some solo material. And gradually, uh, then the last in line thing came along. Oh, Kings of the Sun. That was just an album I did. But they wanted me to join them and go to Australia. And I, I didn't want to move to Australia. But I loved the band. The band was terrific. All right, right. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. They were like a punk version of ACDC. Oh, no, no, I, I was just going to say, I have a, a real passion for three-piece bands, uh, bands where you have either three, three people or three people and a singer. Uh, I just, that's my favorite type of band to play. I, I can't stand these bands that have, you know, two keyboard players and 16 guitar players. And, you know, it's like, I really love the, the amount of work you have to put in bass, drums, and guitar and make it sound full. So some of these bands that we talked about, Kings of the Sun, were typical of that as, as right. is, is last in line, you know? And uh, so that's something that really speaks to me. 
You mentioned Last in Line, and I believe that's a band you're in with the surviving members of Dio, if if I'm sort of correct. Can you tell us a bit more about that project? Yeah, uh, that's that's kind of how we got together. I, I understand it was just a just a good time uh, jam between uh, Vivian, Vinnie, and Jimmy Bain. Uh, after Ronnie had passed away, they sort of got together one day and said, hey, we should go in a rehearsal room and just play for fun. Just play the old songs. Yeah. Um, which they did. And they thought, this is good. Maybe we should do a gig. And um, they got Andrew Freeman. Uh, Andrew, and I, I'd known Andrew from uh, playing on the Rock Vault, which is a show here in Vegas that I was doing since 2015 yeah. or something. And... Um, so they went off and did some shows, and I guess the shows went down really, really well. Uh, and okay. they thought, well, we'll do some more shows. Somebody offered them a record deal. And they started working yeah, on an original record, and they just uh, played them, recorded and wrote those songs the same way that they had done the Dio songs back in the day. And those three guys were really the formative Dio band. I mean, anything that you hear of Dio is those first two, maybe three albums, and not much else after that. So that was the original Dio band. And they said, well, let's just play the way that we do this. <clears throat> so they, rec they re wrote and recorded a record. And then I think it's fairly common knowledge that right as the record was about to be released, Jimmy Bain passed away, um, oh, no. unfortunately. Um, Jimmy, Jimmy was uh, a good friend of mine. Um, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I actually lived with Jimmy. You know, he had a house in mm -hmm. Woodland Hills, and we lived. I, he, he said, you can, you can stay at the house if you want. And I lived there. Um, and we were, I always describe it as sister, sister bands, you know, because you had yeah. uh, Ozzy here, and you had Dio over here. Both these prior singers of Black Sabbath had careers that were sort of running parallel to each other. And so the individual... Yeah. Uh, members of those bands had counterparts and we got on famously we were really good friends we had a lot of respect for each other so I considered Jimmy to be like a sister sister bass player you know and maybe as a result of all of these things uh, I was asked if I wanted to join the band uh, right. a few I guess they, they wanted to play with a few people there'd been some suggestions and I came down to play and it was just it was just very natural it just worked out perfectly um, and I joined the band right after that. And initially, we just thought we'd play a few shows because we had some commitments to do some gigs, and that was going to be the end of it. But very soon, it became evident that there was a chemistry in the band and that we all got on very well. Um, somehow or other, the band developed a great energy and turned into a second record. Sweet. So we recorded a second record. second record kept, went, was very highly acclaimed. We went out and toured it. It was very well received. And second record went on to third record, and that's where we are now. We have an EP coming out nice. after the summer, a new album coming out in February, uh, and a bunch of touring will happen between those two dates. Excellent. Nice. Congratulations. Thank you. Nice. Yeah. yeah, very nice indeed. Very proud of what we do with Last in Line. It's, to me, it's, it's the band I've always wanted. Uh, mm -hmm. All these other bands, I kind of, uh, they were either trying to, you know, embellish something else, but this is really a band that's... Uh, you know, it's an equal band. I mean, it's the four of us. We are uh, the sum of the parts. Uh, we right. write everything together. We work. We 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 we're very motivated, and we all do things um, to push the band forward. Uh, we all have our areas of expertise. Um, right. You know, I mean, notwithstanding the fact that I mean, Vivian is just a terrific, tremendous guitar player. I mean, here's a guy. Oh yeah plays guitar with a Les Paul and an amp and no pedals. And that's all that's on stage, and it sounds wow. huge. Um, right. Vinny is an incredible drummer, and I like to think that I push him as much as he pushes me, and he certainly pushes me. Um, <laughs> and Andrew is, there's nobody <laughs> else who could do this gig like Andrew. You know, he's, he's right. a, a singer who, you know, delivers, you know, 110% at all times, and he doesn't sound like Ronnie, and yet he does justice to those songs. Um, right. He sounds like Andrew. So it's awesome. It's a wonderful band. Yes. 
So let's uh, touch on your songwriting part of your career. Um, you know, you co-wrote Shot in the Dark, obviously. And um, what what parts do you write first, like lyrics or music or huh. a formula? Or yes. like, how do you get inspired to re- record and, and write songs for and, and for whom? Yeah, well, the answer to that is yes. I write the lyrics Excellent. and I write the music. <laughs> And uh, sometimes I write the music and then I write the lyrics, or sometimes you write them both at the same time. And there really doesn't seem to be any, um, any, any method. I don't have a method to write songs. Uh, I mean, okay. I, suppose it, I suppose to start with it comes from me playing an acoustic guitar and coming up with something that I, some kind of melody that works with a certain chord change. That's usually what the spark is. Yeah. So Fair there's enough. that part. Uh, and then I'll try to put something together from that. And um, invariably, there'll be some uh, melody lines, and from the melody lines, I'll work on lyrics. Now, the other side of that coin is I sit a lot, I sit around a lot with a notepad, and sometimes I'll write lyrics which don't have okay. any music, and so the, the lyrics yeah. are always there in a book or in pages or what have you, and so they are sort of developing ideas. It's not like I'm going to take those actual lyrics and I'm going to put them into a song. It's more like, yeah. oh, there's a story here. Because once I start putting lyrics to a song, that's when the real um, color and ornamentation comes into it. That's where I start to get very uh, thoughtful about how I'm saying these things because I've now got somewhere to, some way to yeah. phrase them. And that's how I write. Mm-hmm. Um, writing with other people is very, is very, uh, is chemistry. It's all it is. It's chemistry. It's like, you know, I love uh, I love ketchup and I love milk, but you don't want to mix the two things together. Sometimes it just doesn't work. You know? <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, I don't. Actually, I don't like milk. I hate. I hate milk. I can't stand anything dairy. But that's that's just, just figuratively speaking. But you know, you can have two two people who are great writers and put them in a room, and there's no guarantee that they're going to come up with anything any good. Um, right. And then there are some people that you just put together, and it's just bang. You know, Steve Lukather was like that with me. I mean, Steve would come over and say, we're going to write on next Tuesday. And he'd come over and I'd sit there and he'd say, okay. And he'd shout, go, I've got to be somewhere in 15 minutes. It was like, okay, well, whatever. And we'd sit down, pick up a couple of guitars, bang some chords, come up with some melody, record it. And there was the basic of a, basis of a whole, entire song there. And then I would, I would spend right. a lot of time, you know, really kind of arranging and coming up with, with different things. And, and we'd finish these songs like this. Uh, when we write with Last in Line, it's a similar thing. We go into a room, no ideas, no songs, no nothing, no tapes, and somebody will start banging something or somebody will start playing something. And we'll just jam and all of a sudden we'll say, well, that sort of sounds like a verse. Where would that go? Well, we yeah. could go here, we could go there. Oh, that seems to work. Let's play those two things together. That works great. How do we get back into the first part? Oh, this seems to work. Literally, that's how we wrote the, 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 we, we've written the last two albums. And then, great. of course, wow. we have to sit there and, you know, Andrew has to work on some melodies and sometimes we'll, we'll each kind of lend a hand here and there um, and, and write songs that way. And then uh, very often I write on my own. I mean, I write a lot of stuff on my own. It's one dimension of writing on your own. It, you have to really work to try to stop everything sounding exactly the same. Right, right. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's nature to go to the same chord changes, you know. Oh, I love this chord change. Oh, I love that chord change. And you find yourself do, repeating the same thing. You know, I listen to the people. You know, one of my biggest influences, I'm sorry I didn't credit him before, but probably one of my earliest, earliest influences was David Bowie. And to this oh. day, if I want to get inspired, you know, I will listen to early Bowie stuff because he would always find different changes to go through. And all right. of a sudden I'd yeah. say, wow, you know what? That's a kind of cool change. I've never really played with that much. You know, he has more chord changes than than everybody. I mean, everyone else. It's like you know, you listen to the Stones. There's one, four, five most of the time. You know, there's right. a few there's a few different things that they come up with here and there. But I don't know what what it was about Bowie. I mean, maybe because maybe because he was in essence a folk singer, but he had different influences and different changes. Shouldn't shouldn't actually that be different ch- ch- changes? Yeah, very good. Ha ha ha. Yeah. And then you know you sorry. <laughs> you listen to that. You listen to the, you listen to that. You listen to Life on Mars. You listen to some of these songs, and 
hear how he goes through and finds things that you wouldn't normally normally go to in a very typical fashion. And then if right. you know, even taking one of those one of those types of changes and seeing how how Melody works across it, you know that. There, there are people out there who will analyze melodies and analyze scales and, you know, I've done some of that. I can do it. I can go through modes yeah. and I can, yeah. I can talk about that stuff. But really, it's much, more surre- uh, it's much more granular than that. You just hear something and then you hear a way a melody goes on, to, way on top of that. And that's how I create things. I don't say, well, you know, if I'm going to a five and then I can go to a dominant fifth and then a flat and seventh. But I don't think that way. You mentioned earlier about being nominated for a Grammy for the song you wrote for Toto, but I believe you're vice president of NARAS, which is the organisation behind the Grammys. Can you explain how that happened and kind of what and kind of what your role entails? Yeah, um, what, uh, the the song was that was nominated for a Grammy was nominated for a Grammy for its production. I think it's important to yeah to to, 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 to get that correct. Congratulations. Well, thanks, but I I, I wouldn't want to say the wrong thing. So. Um, Naris, um, okay, so Naris, which is the National Association of Recording Arts and Sciences, uh, also known as the Grammys, does lots of things. Uh, it does yeah. uh, typically four things, uh, maybe five, but the big pillars uh, were, of course, the awards that everybody has heard of. Uh, there was advocacy, there was mm-hmm. archiving and pres- uh, preservation. And there was music cares. And these are the four yeah. things, the main four things that the Grammys would do. Um, my, when I played with Ozzy, the drummer was Randy Castillo, who was probably my closest friend. And Randy, unfortunately, passed away uh, after a, a very long bout with cancer uh, in, a, in 2002. And um, during that time, uh, music cares really helped him out. Um, obviously, it didn't save him, but I think he would have got through, gone through a lot more suffering were it not for, for the assistance that they managed to to give him. And so, I kind of thought that it would be nice for me to, you know, return something to the community and to do something for music cares. Yeah. So, um, I was at the Nam show and I walked past the Grammy booth, and I said, "Oh, Grammys! Hmm, I'd kind of like to be uh, involved in that. I'd like to be maybe on the board." And I was, a, I was a voting member for the Grammys. There's not that many. There's, I think, 12,500 voting members. Um, and so the next thing, I knew somebody who was on the board, and they said, well, why don't you run, you know, put yourself up for election to the board? And I went through, yeah. put a ballot in, um, and uh, make a long story short, I got elected to the governing board in Los Angeles. Um, very quickly, uh, I started doing gra- grassroots um, events for the Grammys, uh, for music cares, fundraisers, stuff like that. Um, but I started becoming very interested in something else. And that something else was probably the other pillar of the Grammys, which was advocacy. All of a sudden, I became very interested in the laws and how we were lobbying for laws and how, you know, this is an exciting time, right? All of a sudden, yeah. it's not just records and tapes. Now it's streaming. Now it's t- right. downloading. Now it's sharing music. Yeah. And all of a sudden... It's the Wild West. There's no laws out there. There's no, there's no one. And of course, everybody's clambering for rights to do things. And who's getting left in the dirt is the musicians. Right. So I became very passionate about advocacy. And I said, well, you know, I want to do this. So very rapidly, I got involved in that. And then I became a chairman of the advocacy committee for the Grammys. Uh, and uh, it was terrific, actually, because the main guy on there was Lamont Dozier, from, you know, who wrote all the... Motown hits, you know, and this, right. this is, nice. this guy's a legend and I'm sitting here working with him on advocacy stuff. It was, it was terrific. We went to DC many times and lobbied house representatives, congressional representatives. Uh, I really got an insight into how laws are created. Um, mm. And then when I came back, uh, I'd been on the board for, I don't know how many years, six years, five or six years or something. And I eventually elected, uh, put myself up. Uh, uh, people said, yeah, you should be VP of the, of the board. And so I became vice president. I put myself up, made a speech, got elected as vice president of Los Angeles, which a position nice. I held for two years. Um, and it, we did a lot more of the same. And uh, we got to a point, I think, where my next step would have been to term out or become president 
or trustee. Um, and for reasons that I don't want to get into too much right now, I felt like I'd given enough time to the Grammys about eight years later, and I said, it's maybe just time for me to move on. And so I moved right. on. But I did a lot of good stuff there. I was responsible for um, uh, the three things, I think, uh, the white spaces issue, uh, which was dealing with um, reserving and, 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 and ownership of uh, frequency bands that musicians and artists use on the road for wireless systems. Right, Those right. are very, very yeah. sought after. Okay? Absolutely. Uh, that, um, the, the airline's um, FAA ruling regarding the bringing of instruments into aircraft cabins was something I was partially responsible for. So, um, Excellent. You know, so they can't really turn around and say, no, you can't bring that guitar onto this plane. They, in fact, um, a detail is not up to the gate staff. It's up to the crew on the planes and, the, and they are, yeah. they are well versed in this and they know that if there's any way that they can bring that, that instrument on that they should use their best efforts to do so. Uh, that was a big Excellent. deal. Yeah. Um, the music, uh, the other thing was uh, the PRA, the Performance Rights Act, which was something that we had been fighting for years. I mean, I, if I was to say close to 100 years, that's not inaccurate. Uh, but everybody had play, paid lip service to it. Uh, until President Trump actually took a look at it and went, no, oh, this makes perfect sense, and signed it in as part of the music, the MMA, the Music Modernization Act. That's a huge, huge deal because it means that artists can now collect neighboring rights. I don't know if you know Excellent. too much about this stuff. But for years and years, American artists could not collect neighboring rights, royalties. And so um, uh, it's, a, it's a huge source of revenue for artists. And it's one that uh, foreign countries, because of reciprocity, wouldn't pay Americans, and so they would take that money and use it to finance education, music education in their schools. Uh, yeah. so, so this was a really important thing as well. Right. It was very cathartic. Uh, probably another very cathartic thing was a showcase for entertaining the troops in Iraq and Kuwait. Oh, How yeah. did you end up doing that? <laughs> we put it, Vinny, Vinny Apice, um, had uh, we had uh, talked in about 2005, I think it was. I've known Vinny a long, long time. And right, he said, right. hey, you know, we're thinking about putting an all-star band together. And uh, do you want to be part of it? And I said, I'd love to. It was him, Carlos Cavazzo, uh, uh, myself, and Joe Lynn Turner. And so we put a band together and we said, well, let's go out and do some shows under, under the name Big Noise. So we went out and made, did these shows. And the people loved the shows. We just play hits from our own catalogs. And well, yeah, yeah. one day, and it, it gradually became a revolving door type of band because everyone was still busy with other bands. So somebody would go out. Vinny couldn't do some shows, so we'd get Simon Wright from ACDC. You know, Carlos couldn't do some shows, so we'd get George Lynch to do some shows. So we were really kind of a, a revolving door band. And uh, one day it was presented to us, would you like to go and entertain troops in Iraq and Kuwait? And I was just like, yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, Heck yeah. I'm also a big history buff as well, and, and I've spent years studying Middle yeah. Eastern history. So, and I've been to the Middle East many, many times. So, okay. this wasn't this wasn't something that was terribly new to me, but it was something that was very exciting for me. And I said, "Yeah, I'd love to do this." So we put a band together and said, "Okay, these guys are available." It was uh, Carlos Cavazzo, it was Simon Wright, myself, Joel Turner, and. Uh, Alex Van Bubenheim, a composer who I'd gotten to know doing feature film work. We went to Kuwait and we went to Iraq for two weeks. They asked us, they said, where do you want to go? Not literally, where do you want to go, but do you want to go to big um, bases or do you want to go to FOBs, forward operating bases, or do you want to go to, you know, where do you want to go? And I remember right. we said, well, we want to go where no one else has gone. They said, you sure about that? I said, yes. Okay. So, so we find ourselves getting out of a helicopter in uh, Fob Shield, which is in Fallujah, right in the middle of Baghdad. And a bunch of soldiers who looked at us and went, what the fuck are you doing here? And we said, <laughs> we came here to play. And they said, do you have any idea where you are? And we said, nah, kind of. You are in probably the most dangerous part of the Middle East right now. You know that. This is, this is Death Alley here. And we went, oh, wow. okay. And uh, I mean, we 
developed a very special bond with some of those soldiers, a great deal of respect for them. Um, I bet. Yeah. I, I mean, these are people that wake up one morning and they get marching orders that they've got to go somewhere for 15 months. No ifs, ands, or buts. You're off. See ya. Goodbye. Good luck. And they go. Yeah. And they do what they have right. to do. Whether they uh, personally believe in it, like it, dislike it, don't believe in it, whatever it is, is irrelevant. I mean, this really is a call yeah. to duty um, that they have to have a discipline about. And as a result of that, I, I have nothing but intense admiration for the military and what they do. It's incredible. They're unbelievable. Absolutely. And we had such a great Absolutely. time with them, in touch with many of those people still after all these years. Um, it was just, it was incredible. I mean, the idea that um, we did some crazy stuff. I mean, we would travel on Chinook helicopters at night because during the day you'd be shot at. So you run wow. on things with, you know, infrared goggles, which they, I was like, all right, can I keep these? No, you can't. Just put them on. <laughs> so, you know, you run onto this, run onto this Chinook with the engines going because they don't shut it down. The, no lights. So you're literally running into two engines. And you, the minute you think you're about to catch fire, you find yourself inside a helicopter. The thing takes off. It's flying around. There's three gunners sitting there with guns, like looking down over at the ground. You're flying in darkness. You land. All this equipment comes off. The next day, everything is set up. You play a show, take it down, repeat, rinse and repeat. <laughs> it's just the weirdest wow. thing. Wow. It was very cool. That is, yeah, that's pretty wild. We saw some incredible stuff. We got to fire guns. We got to play with tanks. We got to sit in Apache helicopters. Um, we had lots and lots of very privileged opportunities. Uh, I got to some historical stuff. I spent a lot of time in the Alfar Palace, which was the Saddam Hussein's palace that was become the multinational headquarters, um, shown sites, shown things that I don't even want to repeat, stuff that was horrific, uh, stuff that was... Um, but the most important thing, I think, is... Uh, uh, the most important lesson, I think, is that you don't really... You don't really know what's going on somewhere until you go there. You can watch exactly. all the news all you want. And I, I grew up in London, Gareth, uh, you grew up uh, in Wales. Um, I was very. I grew up in next door to Kilburn, which was the Irish community in London, and we were very, yeah. very aware in the in the in the mid seventies about the trouble that was going on in Northern Ireland. And to be honest with you, I still don't understand it. And I was that close to it. So to to think that yeah. these days people watch television, they think they know everything about what's going on everywhere in the world. When you actually go there and put your feet on the ground, I think that you learn more in one in one minute than you can learn in. In days, oh, days, totally, days of totally, books. totally, without a doubt, because you because you like sort of become absorbed in it. And okay, without getting too heavy, the things you read and see elsewhere always have somebody else's slant on them as well, don't they? Yes, they are editorial in nature, and uh, right. that's 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 an issue that 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 occurs all the time. And uh, I know that uh, yeah. this isn't a political show, so I'm not going to make it political, but. I think it's important to realize that there's probably two sides to, you know, to every story, and that two in the two entities that might find themselves in opposition uh, are going to have different narratives, and it's very very difficult to cut, try to extract anything non-editorial or opinion related from just just reportage, just actual news reportage, and I just don't think it is. Well, moving kind of swiftly on to kind of more more recent times, I believe that you um, operate and run a Pro Tools Masterclass. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, not not exactly a Pro Tools Masterclass. I became a consultant for Pro Tools back in 1998, right, right as they were starting to sort of uh, um, emerge is a good way of putting it. Uh, they were you know, trying to come up against the behemoth that was the, uh, the, the previous industry, the tape industry. Um, and uh, I was trying to be a producer. Uh, I was good at it. I knew I could do what I wanted, but it was very close shop. So it was diff a difficult circle to get to break into, um, particularly because you were going to have to be entrusted with a $2,000 a day studio. And no one was going right. to give you $2,000 a day to work in the studio. So... Um, all of a sudden, I started, you know, becoming aware of 
non-linear recording and mixing and uh, and I thought wow well maybe just maybe this could be the way of the future and I contacted uh, at, uh, DigiDesign at the time and said hey would you guys be open to training me and they said well we don't really train anybody but we do know who you are and here's we'll make a deal with you so if you want we will take you up to Palo Alto for two weeks and you can train with our guys up here uh, and uh, then you can go back to Los Angeles and you can help us promote our product to all the people who you know and should any sales de develop out of that we can give you a local dealer and you can cut a deal with them and, 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 and work something out with them and I said okay sure seems like a good idea so I, was, I learned about it I went to LA <clears throat> over the course of the next few years I was probably responsible for I would say close to half of all the systems that were sold in LA um, That's great. the original way they broke into that was not through music it was of course through film um, right. up until that time people had been using these uh, sort of hybrid these Tascam digital dubbers which were capable right. of 8 or 16 tracks onto a tape and they had walls of these things for the multitudes of tracks that would come in for mo movies and all of this, these things were synchronized together yeah. and you turn around and said hey you know what you can replace each of these $10,000 machines of which you have like 50 here with one computer and that can do everything that these do, these things do. That became a very interesting proposition for them. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of what happened and I, you know, and I had made money doing that, but for me it was money for old rope. I didn't really care about it. It was like, hey, you know, they buy some systems from this company. I get a check. Cool. Thanks a lot. Um, right. Ironically, the very reason I got into it was to become a producer as more and more artists started buying these systems, they needed to produce a less and less because people started producing themselves yeah. at home, right? Well, that's kind of a misnomer too because, you know, artists definitely need producers and outside ear to help them out, right? Yes, they do. <laughs> so... Yes, they do. Yes, they do. A friend of mine just called me yesterday, and uh, day, day before yesterday, and said, I'm working on this record, and the guitar player sent me his tracks, and he sent me like 12 track guitar tracks and said, here's like 12 tracks, and why don't you, uh, you know, you figure out what, uh, what bits you want to use. And he said, I, I, I don't really know. And, uh, and I said, well, that's why you need a producer. That's right. You know, that's you need right. a producer to, to produce. And, um, you know, it's, it's very easy for people to say, oh, here's 12 tracks. But, you know, as a, as a, as a, if, if you are producing, if you're producing yourself, you should be able to make those decisions and come up with the one track and say, that's, yeah, track. that's the one, right, exactly. I yeah. find it very interesting because yeah. from an it. intellectual point of view, you know, um, yeah, we know what an incision is, right? An incision is to, is to cut something, cut, cut into right. something. There's another word that comes from the same root, which is decision. And making a decision mm -hmm. is cutting away. It's removing the bits you don't want, yeah. right? And yeah. to produce, you have to be able to make those decisions. And you have to be able to have the conviction to remove, to know what it is that you want, and to remove those parts. And if you're not able to do it, then hire somebody that is, and that you trust. And that's really where the producer yeah. comes in. Agreed. You know, anybody can sit there and just yeah, come up definitely. with, I could come up with 50 bass parts and go, there's 50 tracks, you, you, you know, you, you figure, figure them out. out. <laughs> 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 wow. So I understand also that you're a brand ambassador for a few different companies. At this point, can you tell us about some of those? Sure. Uh, I, this has all sort of come apart as, um, you know, I mentioned that I sort of got to learn learn a lot about the film industry, and right. as a result, uh, I eventually started working in film. I started becoming. I decided I wanted to be a re-recording mixer or a dubber. That's the that's the guy at the end who nice. mixes all the sound to the picture. And I thought this is going to be, oh boy, this is going to be so exciting. And I started working with some really big guys, guys who worked, uh, uh, Rick Klein, who's very famous for doing any music movies, uh, uh, people at Sony, Gary Bourgeois, people like that. And I rapidly realized that mixing a feature film has very little to do with mixing. Um, primarily, it has to do with uh, uh, controlling a bunch of uh, um, um, tempers that are in the 11th hour of what's been a two or three year project. Um, it's a real diplomatic exercise. And also, um, the actual mixing, there wasn't much to do. 
I mean, there really wasn't. It was not wasn't that creative. I mean, it's literally levels and let's duck right. this, let's duck that, and let's boost this, and you know, all the work has been done by all the editors and stuff. So right. it wasn't that creative, and I, I just didn't like being around that energy. It was just it was it was ang it was very anxious. Um, and then, quite by accident, I got asked to become a music editor on a picture, and all of a sudden, I found something I absolutely loved. And music editorial was like, wow, you get to stylize the film. The you know, picture editor says, here's a film. There's no music. It's just footage. And you, right. need to, you need to add something to make this picture come to life. And so I spent months going into libraries and pulling, you know, 30 and 40 soundtracks and chopping them all up and comping stuff and coming up with temp tracks. And then that would go to the composer. The composer would then try to recreate or rewrite stuff in the spirit of what you've put together and then preparing okay. all the music for the stage preparing it to go to the final mix all of that stuff was great i loved it so um it would my, my my film career after several quite quite uh, quite a few films um got cut short by the um by the financial crisis in 2008 2009 the budgets disappeared from a lot of the films uh okay. the tentpole films carried on uh, the independents, well, they stayed independent for no budget, and all the ninety percent of the stuff in the middle lost their budgets. And so I was being represented by Modern Music, by Lee Kotkin, and he called me up and he said, "I can't even get work for my own editors, so I'm going to let you go." And um, and it was too bad because you know, I really liked it. But then I got back into music again. However, mm -hmm. however, I still carried on uh, my relationships with all the companies that I'd met. And so right. I started a pro audio company um, that was okay. focused more on consulting, workflow consulting than it was on just a retailing. Um, and I became very close with some of the companies that I met. Two of the companies in particular, um, one is Cedar Audio out of the UK, who makes noise reduction systems. And okay. these people are these people are brilliant. I mean, this is this is nerdy stuff as far as nerdy stuff gets, but it's incredible. Um, they have designed ways to remove noise from audio and the ways in which those audio products can be used are as numerous as, as there are, um, you know, uh, stars in the sky. <laughs> um, so for example, I think a lot of their stuff is originally designed as forensics. So they okay, were right. dealing with uh, uh, the FBI, CIA, uh, surveillance tapes, wanting to hear what people are saying. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they have tools that are able to remove noise from restoring vinyl albums. And then you can remove background noise. And then all of a sudden you right. can remove like an, AC, an air conditioning unit uh, when somebody's trying to make a speech in a, in a hole. And you could, this stuff that they make, which fits into every single vocation of, of, of sound. And so it became very nice. exciting for me to try to take that, take their products into live performance. We found that, um, for example, their DNS system, which just removes background noise from, from a microphone. Well, if you have a guy on stage and his microphone's going through a DNS, you can reduce all the noise that comes from the ambience of the, of the stage, from the noise that's around. You can gain another six, seven, eight dB without fear of feeding back, without fear of a, uh, uh, so yeah. it, there's a purpose for this, and it's a yeah, purpose really which is un, untapped. Yeah, totally. Um, so between that, um, you know, one of the other uh, uh, products, of course, uh, are wireless systems. I think wireless systems. We've in the music world, we use a lot of wireless microphones. We use a lot of belt packs. We use a lot of wireless headphones, and we have been forced to endure products which are uh, nice. To put it nicely, prosumer standard. They're right. not that great. Um, when you look at some of these technologies that are out there, um, there's a company called Electrosonics that I'm very close with. And this is a company that makes things that are, uh, I like to refer to them as, uh, as, uh, as, 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 uh, as, uh, as um, almost avionics or military grade. I mean, this stuff is, is okay. bulletproof and is extremely reliable. Um, and is a whole different standard above what we've become used to. Uh, they are yeah. about 
of all the post-production and pro uh, broadcast TV film world is there, everything is electrosonics, yet they have zero presence in music. And I started you know, working with some okay. of their products. We started adapting the products, making some changes to the firmware so that they could be used by musicians. And I've never looked back. I mean, my wireless system for my, my bass, um, I've never had a dropout. It's been four years, five years now. Not one single time. Not, no interference, no clicks, no pops, nothing. My in-ear systems, ditto. You know, and this is just the greatest thing in the world. Um, it's not cheap, but I think it's, uh, you know, for people who care enough about that stuff, uh, we feel there's a whole world out there that needs to be made aware that there are better alternatives to the usual suspects. Yeah, absolutely, and that's great. Thank you. Mm. So that's what I'm, what I'm doing. I'm trying to take these, take these products and, and introduce them into music, and as such, I guess the word ambassador is probably a pretty good one. You know, I'm trying right. to represent these products and just do what I did with, yeah. with Pro Tools back in the early days. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Nice. Oh, gosh. What's his name? There was a producer back then, and he was working with Bonnie Raitt. Uh, uh, who produced Bonnie Raitt? Uh, let's see. Don Was did a couple of records. Ed Cherney did some records. Ed Cherney. Ed Cherney. And I should know Ed, rest his soul in peace, because... He came with us Absolutely. on advocacy uh, things to DC as well. And it was Ed Chern right. who called me up one day, and I was talking to him on the phone. I'd never spoken to him before. And I was trying to talk, to, talk him into Pro Tools. And he said, no, hold on, let me get this straight. Are you telling me that I could get a laptop and I could go get on a plane with Bonnie Raitt and go to Hawaii and go into a bedroom and set up a microphone and some headphones and I could record her vocals in a hotel room in Hawaii on a laptop? And it would sound as good as a studio. And I said, yep. He went, you're kidding. I don't believe you. <laughs> and, and, and it was, it was, a, a, it was a aha moment, right? Right, and of course. Similar to that, I try to find this aha moment for people who are using wireless systems and looking for something better out there. Or looking to use sound, awesome. you know, noise reduction to improve their performances. Right. Awesome. Well, we'll have to get together about all that because, you know, I love to get rid of the noise out of my stuff as well. Yeah. So, but sometimes I find that, you know, it kind of interferes with the original source signal to a point where it, it almost makes it, you know, it, it infringes upon it too much for me. Absolutely. Right? And the whole problem is the artifacts that are generated by some of the, the other, the uh, other pros products out there and things like Cedar, they, the, what differentiates Cedar from say all of the other manufacturers who have a, an offering in noise reduction is the fact that there are no artifacts. And so okay. this, is, uh, this is why they're the best product out there. And they have products that are very, very specific. I'll give you an example. So they have a harm removal tool, okay, which is called, okay. uh, what's it called? It's called D-Buzz. What is it called? Yeah, D-Buzz, I think it's called. And, uh, you know, I mean, removing the hum from something like mains hum, imagine you're recording a track and you get to the end yeah. of the track, everybody hits that last chord and it fades out. And all you're left with is the guitar players like, yeah, hum that you can hear over there. So, so many times. How do you remove that? You can either remove it, I suppose you could remove it either with EQ. That's not going to work very right. well. You could remove it by okay. trying to remove the energy from a frequency band. So you'd be using frequency selective compression. Uh, that sort of works as well, but you still have the problem. The problem you have is you have a 50 cycle hum uh, in the States, 60 cycles. Right. And right. You have the, the, the 60 cycle fundamental hum, but then you have harmonics. And if you look at Correct. it, you're going to have all of these things. And until you remove all those harmonics, you're not going to get rid of it. And so their, their, their product is able to tune in on the actual fundamental and on the first, second, third, and fourth level harmonics, tune in on those and actively find some way, a way to reduce the energy in, in that. And it works. It's, it's wow. pure genius. And to work, the great thing about Cedar's products is you, they, there's usually two knobs. Okay. There's no more than that. It's like how much do you want to reduce, how sensitive do you want it to be. Done. Every single done. thing. Wow. Everything else is done. It's very much like Apple computer used to be. You know, you don't need to know what's okay. in the box. You just need to know this is what you have to press. And that's what's beautiful about their products. That's great. Thank you. Do you have a... Um 
particular rig setup that you actually like to perform live with and 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 is it the sort of same system you actually use in the studio regarding your bass and your speaker setup? Uh, yes and no. Um, yes, I do have a rig that I like. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Ampeg amps. Um, and the I only do. thing I really do with them is uh, I sometimes employ a pedal or two just to drive the front end a little bit more and give it a sort of tonal characteristic that I like. So um, yeah, uh, not much else other than that. So my live rig consists of, I use Music Man basses. I've been using Music Man okay. for years. Uh, I love the Spectre. I love the, uh, the Stingray basses. Uh, I used, used to use Spectre basses all the time. I still love using Spectre basses. I do from time to time. But for tic this particular band, yeah. I, I use my, sting my Stingrays. Um, uh, I use uh, um, various different uh, products. I, I really like EBS's products. They make some okay. great drive pedals. So I use, uh, th there's two, two pedals that I like for drive. One is made by e EBS, and the other one is, uh, is uh, it makes this thing. He says, leaning over. Made by a company called T-Rex, <laughs> out, of, out, of, uh, out of Scandinavia. T Rex oh, yeah. also makes some really great drive pedals. So I, I'll usually find something and, and I won't drive it that much. I'll just add a little bit of saturation to the front end that has a tonality that I think is works well with the style of music I'm playing. That's Perfect. pretty much it. Wireless system, into that, into an Ampeg. Ampeg brings the thunder. There is no amp like an Ampeg. Uh, used right. to love Marshalls back in the day, but they don't make they don't really imp import their base equipment into the United States. I don't know why. Uh, so I've been with Ampeg since 1988 or 87. Great. Now, when I go home, when I'm in the studio, it's a different matter altogether. Um, I'll employ guitar amps for bass. I'll use DIs. Yeah. Uh, I'll use uh, sometimes a couple of amps. Um, it's not unusual for me to use, like, what am I using right now? Um, I'm using a small SVT. Uh, 20 watt Portaflex going into a uh, 12 inch base cabinet, and then I've got a Tweed Deluxe guitar amp, and I'm feeding that as well, and then I'm feeding a DI, and I'm getting my body out of the SVT, and I'm adding in the DI for anything that's missing, and I'm getting that that saturation and that kind of singing distortion out of the Tweed Deluxe, out of the guitar amp. But sometimes I use a, I've got a Marshall 1974X over here, and that's why I keep looking over, right. making sure no one's right. stolen it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have different amps. I have Rivera amps. I have um, all kinds of things. I've got, uh, I've got this, uh, this amp, this really nice amp that was given to me by the nice folks at Nady years and years ago, and it's a 6L6 amp, a twin, so it's a 50-watt combo, and that, sometimes oh, that nice. sounds really good for the bass as well. And then I mix all of these things together and I get a, a tone that is big and that sings and that has the low end. Nice. Um, mm -hmm. And it just sings. That's the way I can describe it. It's got this. It, and sometimes I'll use different basses. Sometimes I'll use passive basses of precision. You know, I, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll use whatever. Look at this. Look at this. I dug this out. This was given to me by Boz Burrell years and years ago before. From bad company. Oh wow! One of the original wow. um, Steinbergers. I forget what the number is. Oh like wow! One hundred and twenty or something. But I'll even use this sometimes, you know, and, and just I'll just try anything and see what it sounds like. Yeah. And you never know. Sure. Sometimes you go, wow, this this works great with this track. It really, really cuts through. Right. You yeah. know? right. Exactly. That's how I love to do it too. Is for, you know, per track, per instrument, which one sounds the best, and go. Well, that's like yeah. the Roy Thomas Baker thing, isn't it? I mean, you know, you, you take is. a track and you treat it completely as an individual, unique track. and That's right. And that's beautiful. There's, there's nothing worse than saying, okay, everyone got our sounds, let's cut an album. <laughs> you know, it's like it's every, right, every right. song exactly the same. You know? <laughs> yeah. And you know that's done every day of in some is. forms of music. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately for that form of music. <laughs> well, some forms it's probably good. I mean, I can, I can imagine the nightmare of a you know, a symphony orchestra, each person going, hang on a second, let's try this violin now. Oh, no, no, hold on, I want to try my triangle. I've got this triangle sure. I used on an ACDC track, you know. <laughs> but that would be chaos, right? 
that that would be chaos right so so let's spin this completely out of control yeah. and uh, step away from the music part of your life for a little bit. And I believe that you've been heavily involved in the world of food, right? Food. Which is one of my passions as well, right? So I know you open several restaurants and you have cookbooks going and like if you weren't busy enough. So like, can you tell us about your passion for food and the restaurant business and how did you get involved in all that stuff, dude? We all got to eat. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thanks. True. Great. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'd love to tell you. I'd love to tell you how it came about. I have no idea. It's something I've been interested in since I was very young. It was probably, you know, my mom had a very uh, had a an absolute ban on anyone going into the kitchen. You know, we weren't allowed in the kitchen. Oh. I mean, we we were not a wealthy family by any stretch of the imagination. I'd say we 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 were. Uh, a hardworking family who didn't have much. And okay. uh, so, you know, the things that we did have, you know, my mom took a lot of pride in cooking and she was, she's a great, she, she was, she is, she's a great chef. Um, and uh, she, she, she came, she was, she was French Moroccan. So she grew up and she was born in Casablanca. And so oh. she had, we had some very exotic kind of uh, uh, dishes flying around. And, uh, Maybe it was the combination of the chemistry sort of chemistry mindset, and uh, okay. anytime she went left the house, I would dive into the kitchen and start making things. It was just kind of a, <laughs> a fun thing to do, you know. Um, that's probably how it started, and then later on, um, um, uh, growing up in London, I left home when I was quite young, and again, I didn't have very much money. I I had nothing, um, you know. I remember. Back then, I used to smoke, so you could buy a pack of cigarettes a day, or you could buy a burger, and it, but not both. Right. You know, so. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I I quickly found out some of my friends were in the same predicament, and uh, I remember we found out if we all kind of got together at somebody's house, and somebody would we put our money together, and somebody would cook, we could have like a really good evening, you know, and we could have a fun mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Somebody would bring a bottle of wine. Somebody would bring some beers. We cook some great food, have a, sit around, have a laugh. Um, and some of my friends, uh, one of my friends, Ben, was a great cook. And, and then I, I, I used to cook as well. And, and that's probably how it started. So okay. um, by the time I moved to the States, you know, I, was, I would prefer to cook at home than to go out to, to, to restaurants all the time. Right. Um, started cooking yeah. more, more and more. and became much more adventurous. Started entertaining people. I, I very quickly found out that cookery and music are, are indeed the same form of entertainment. People come over, right. they sit down, they relax, they have a good time, uh, and you feel like you're the host. So um, I love that. Um, and eventually, I, I, was, I was always very passionate about um, uh, Japanese cookery as well. Uh, okay. Probably take too long to get into why, but every time I went to Japan, Every time I came, there was something that just drew, drew me to, maybe it was the, maybe it was the finesse, maybe it was the uh, perfection that they affiliate with cooking and how everything is supposed to be an experience uh, rather than, uh, you know, over quantity. Um, right. So I became very passionate about that. I became friendly with some Japanese chefs. And eventually one day I had the idea of doing a Japanese restaurant and put, put a restaurant together with a couple of other investors. And uh, it turned out to be quite successful. Uh, unfortunately, one day those uh, two partners, uh, they woke up one morning, decided they didn't want to be in the restaurant business anymore. And oh. that's the problem with partners. So, uh, yep. you know, when, when other people are, can make decisions that in effect something that you're uh, passionate about, you know, you, you really have to take that into consideration, I think. Uh, right. But, you know, I went on television, did some cooking. Uh, I was on Guy Fieri's, one of Guy Fieri's shows. He had me come on and cook. Um, oh, sweet. Yeah. And then I just, I, I just loved the whole, the whole idea of cooking. I mean, during the pandemic, I started doing the 59 Second Gourmet, the, uh, the COVID kitchen, which was, okay. you, could, you could post up to one minute on Instagram. So I basically cooked things, condensed them into 59 seconds of on Instagram. Nice. <laughs> and people really <laughs> loved them. Yeah, wow, this is good. really cool. In fact, there's a show, there's a show here um, in Vegas 
called Spill the Tea, which is okay. a show for British expats, by British expats. And uh, it's every Tuesday morning. It's on Facebook. And lots and lots of people watch it. And I would go on there frequently, and they would use my, uh, they would show the 59 Second Gourmet frequently on that. So they, they, in fact, they, That's they, they, they keep telling me, <laughs> Phil, you've got, you got to do some more. Come on. Come on. Pull up your socks, old chap. Let's have some more 59 seconds. <laughs> gourmet. <laughs> Running out of things. <laughs> it's difficult. It's difficult. You've got to cook, and you've got to film yourself with one hand, and, and then you have to edit it, you know. All right. <laughs> Very, That's it's, pretty it's, very, awesome. it's very rough around the edges. There's nothing polished about it. Right. And, right. Yeah. And I managed to drink during every episode as well. Which is important. Oh, it's very important. Was it wine or yeah, what would you drink? You've got to stay hydrated. Whatever I get my hands on. <laughs> wine, beer, <laughs> vodka, tequila. Didn't matter, right? No. No, not at all. I'm not fussy. <laughs> that sounds awesome we've spoken uh, this evening about things that you've done mainly in the past but what does the future hold uh, for Phil oh I have no idea I have the faintest <laughs> idea I know, if I knew what that the, if I even thought about that from day one I probably wouldn't be here but um, I don't know I, I just uh, I don't really do that thing where somebody sets a goal and says that's what I want to do. Um, I just kind of am more cons more interested to find out what what happens next. Um, yeah. And I I would never have been able to plan any of these things. I have no regrets about anything I've done. I'm glad I've made all the decisions I have, um, and I'm very Excellent. thrilled with them. Um, you know, some I, I remember that uh, if I cast my cast my mind back to leaving Aussie. Um, Randy Castillo, as I mentioned, my dear friend, he, he and I got into it a little bit uh, when okay. I left Aussie. Yeah. He said, you really shouldn't do this. And I, from his perspective, he, was, he had one of his best friends in the, in the same band, and, um, uh -huh. if not his best friend. And we were, you know, I mean, we were the, the gruesome twosome. I mean, that's what we would do. We were, ju we were just a team. And, and, I, and I got it. And I said, yeah, but I just got to do different things. Um, and then it wasn't until many, many years later when he was, you know, terminally ill and he said, you know, I got to tell you something. I was kind of mad at you when you left the band. But when you look at all the things that you did versus all the things I never did, I think you did the right thing. Um, and it was something I held very dear to me, very dear to me that he said something Absolutely. like that. And, and I really became appreciative of the things that I've done. So I try not to sort of preempt too many things or confine myself. Maybe it's a better right. word. Okay. Uh, but I'm yeah, just yeah. open to what happens. I don't know. I mean, there are certain things I'm excited about. I've, you know, I've written an autobiography, which is going to be coming out soon. And that's Excellent. finished now. So I can look forward to that. Yeah. Uh-oh. No, I'm there. Stand by. Well, Phil, welcome back. And um, after that little gone. stock market crash, and I just want to know, how can our viewers find out more about you? Well, they can certainly go to lastinlineofficial.com, okay. mm -hmm. which is the band's website. Uh, I do have an Instagram, at, which is at Phil Susan, all one word. Okay. Uh, I do have a Facebook, which is Phil Susan Official music page, I think it okay. is. Okay. I have to think about that. <laughs> and uh, I just started a TikTok, but there's not there's hardly anything up there. All yet. right. Mm -hmm. That's the, those are the best ways to find me. Cool. Great. Thank you. Nice. Yeah. The, and they can go to my website as well, which is philsusan.com. Awesome. You know. So nice. these are the, these nice. are the best ways. Awesome. Thank you very much. We usually like to finish off with sort of a bit of a bit of a fun question. And obviously we've spoken about the things that you're well known for and kind of famous for. But what we'd like to know is, do you have any kind of hidden talents or, or kind of superpowers that, that you, that, that people don't necessarily know about? Superpowers. Superpowers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> da, 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 da. Actually, sort of hidden talents. Yeah. Hidden talents. Uh, yeah. I'm, I, I, I do a lot of stuff. Um, I love to. Uh, I love to do um, 
anything to do with anything mechanical. I love fixing things, mm -hmm. rebuilding engines, rebuilding motorcycles, rebuilding, wow. you name it. Nice. Fixing air conditioner units. I fix AC units for my neighbors and stuff. Nice. Um, uh, it's just, I understand that stuff. I can take things to bits and I can fix them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a piece of electronic equipment or it's a washing machine. I just I had a grandfather who was a watchmaker and uh, he, he kind of taught me that if anything is built by one human, another human can fix it or improve on, upon yeah. it. And it's always been, and maybe it's that, that sort of technical mind I've always had, okay. yeah. but I love taking things apart and fixing them. Nice. So I do that. Um, I, I fix just about anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think I've found too many things that I can't fix. Nice. Um, so that's, that, you know, if you ask my wife, she'll tell you. you know, I don't think she, I think she, had, I think she has the same kind of reverence for that that I do. I mean, yeah. she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm fixing this. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, why? Because it, it's not working. Okay. Oh. Well, it works fine now. Yeah, because I fixed it. You know? so, so. <laughs> but, nice. you know, yeah. people have to call people. You have to call somebody to fix something. Yeah. And to me, it's almost exciting. It's like a challenge. Okay, yeah. let's see if I can fix this. Mm -hmm. So I'll, you know, I had a bad switch in this yesterday. So I took this switch out and I opened the switch and found out why it wasn't working. Put the switch back together rather than... That's you know, good, right? Nice. Uh, what else do I do? I do a lot. I do a lot in the stock market. I've been doing that okay. for years. Um, and I do things that are to do with mainly option trading. I've been doing it for 30 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I just get it. I understand it. I, it's too complicated to get into because there's statistics, right. there's algebra, there's, there's uh, trends, there's, there's, there's uh, uh, all kinds of mathematics involved in that stuff. Yeah. And I just get it. I get it instinctively. I just look at it and I understand it. It speaks to me. Yeah. Um, you know, if I talk to people about, about option Greeks and metrics and stuff like that, you can see them start to glaze over very, right. very quickly. But I get it. And, you know, there's been times where it's kept me alive, honestly. Yeah. Uh, in being a musician, you're not really looking at a, a very consistent form of income. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually no uh, pension plans you know, there. You know. Make money here. There really, really isn't. Uh, royalties, I suppose. But, you know, you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to take those peaks and those drops and try to keep an even keel right. through everything. And there's times when, honestly, the market has been has been very, very good to me. Times have been very painful like it is right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's painful for everybody, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's part and parcel of the same thing. You, know, yeah. you kind of have to, if you want to be in it. You gotta be in it. Grin exactly. and bear it, right? Well, Phil, thank you very much. This has been a very informative and a really extremely captivating episode. And those are some incredible stories. Oh. And thanks for sharing you more about you and your history. And uh, I, I really want to thank you thank for being, you. you know, taking the time to be part of this episode of My Right Stuff. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. And thank you so, so much for having me on, Toby, Gareth. And uh, I, uh, I'm so glad that you found it interesting. And hopefully other people... Uh, find it uh, interesting and diverse. I think they will as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you ever so much, Phil. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. And uh, it's, like I said, your stories have been absolutely captivating. Thank you all very, very much. Good night and no star. And I'm your host, Lord Rage Wright. And this has been another informative and very fast paced episode of My Right Stuff. Catch us, catch us, uh, catch up with us again. And remember to listen loud, play hard and keep reaching for your dreams. Thank you for watching. Good night. Do you suffer from insomnia, depression, or anxiety? Well, our sponsor, Tomes, may be able to help you in these areas. Tomes, a natural sleep and sound healing portal, helping people globally to get to sleep faster and stay asleep longer. And you can find this piece of gold at www.taumhoms.com. I want to say a big thank you to all of you who stream, download watch and support my right stuff and please keep spreading the word my friends we really really do appreciate it we also now have a my right stuff store where you can pick up some snazzy merch for those lovely bodies or even gift for a loved one or two go to myrightstuff.com and click on the store tab and don't forget to tag us in any photos with our merch so that we can include you in an episode Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast channel of your choice, as well as our YouTube channel and Spotify channel. 
I hear that it will give you 10 years of good luck. Ring that bell, my friends. This has been another amazing episode of My Right Stuff, and be sure to tune in for this episode and every episode, every fortnight, for another adventurous and informative show. I'm your co-host, Sir Gareth Dighton, and thank you, my lovelies, for tuning in. No star, you beautiful people, and we'll catch you next time.